You don't need to know a specific language, native language, wherever you're at. You can put a toy in front of any child and they'll know how to play with it. It may not be your version or your understanding of play, but they'll know how to play with anything. Yeah, and that's what I know how to do. I know how to play with stuff. Welcome to Generations, where we talk about life with video games and how these video games influence our lives. Thank you for tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. We're your weekly podcast for fun, informative stories about video games and our lives. we got a great episode for you today, and we also have some great hosts. Introducing everybody, my name is Frog, also known as Jason, and also Big Cat. How's it going? All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a little bit of a different direction, and we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into Big Cat's life. And so, Michael, tell everybody a little bit about yourself and a little bit about what you do. All right, thank you. So, I've been a therapist for almost five years now. I've always kind of been fascinated by human behavior just the idea of what makes one person tick and the other doesn't, what people are interested in, you know, how people behave. That's always just been something that I've really found fascinating. In particular with play therapy, when I was going to school to get my degree in marriage and family therapy, I saw that we had kind of a little bit of our internship, so to speak, or practicum that we were mandated to take in order to graduate. All the school sites, or sorry, rather, all the sites were pretty much schools. Most of them were kind of far away, but there was one that was pretty close to my home city. So as I was reading it, you know, it talked a lot about plate therapy, and I really didn't know what it was, but I said, hey, that sounds cool. That sounds really fun. It's close, so why not? Is that funny how that works out? Yeah, it is. Um, seriously, like it just, it just like the stars are aligned. It just so happened to be close. It worked for you. (laughs) Something you're interested in. Yeah. You know, everything else was significantly far away, you know? And so this was like really close. And then just in the description of what the site was, you know, had play. And I was like, Hey, you know, I, I love play. Sounds fun. I don't know what it is, but you know, let's do it. Uh, I don't think I've heard that story before. What other colleges were you looking at? I definitely wanted to go where I knew was familiar. So I looked at a couple different places. The one that was closest to me that had a program uh, was University of Laverne. I was really excited for that. I did look into a few other ones, but they were, you know, kind of in Orange County. And just the idea of having to drive kind of far would have been pretty tough. So you you weren't interested in anything out of state? No, I think. Going out of state would have been pretty hard for me in that moment. Yeah, me too. Just where I was at with my family and everything. So after you kind of chose uh, Laverne as a choice because of play therapy, what what did that mean to you? You know, going into it, knowing a little bit about play therapy and what what you kind of like uh, were uh, expecting. When I got to Laverne, um, you got to learn a little bit about, you know, like the child development, a little bit of the play therapy And then my actual practicum site for doing like my hours and stuff was, you know, within a school district. And so that was where I got majority of my, you know, kind of training and understanding of play therapy. I was fortunate to have two really good registered play therapist supervisors. So it's credential that takes a little bit of uh, experience and time to be able to get, you know, a few years and everything. So I'm forever grateful for that opportunity because I really feel like that, especially my particular individual supervisor. So what play therapy means specifically for me is that I think that it provides children a space, a safe environment to communicate through play. I think we can all resonate that 
when we ask, you know, young children answers such as why did you do that? Or how are you feeling? And they say, I don't know. And that's really just because they really don't know. Uh, so as frustrating as it is for us, obviously it would be great if they could explain what they're feeling or why they did something. They really don't. They don't have the emotional vocabulary yet or really the words to say what they're doing or what they're feeling. So play provides that for them. Just like an outlet for them to express their feelings. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes with them, they, they really don't, you know, they don't verbalize anything. And sometimes they... Most of the times they will work through what they're feeling by themselves. You know, I'm just there to kind of guide them. I'm not there to direct them or push them in any direction. And sometimes you don't know and they are better, you know, after the course of treatment and you desperately want to know what happened or what they were thinking. Yeah. But we'll never know. That's crazy. That's so cool. It's you get like the satisfaction that you're helping somebody that you know, needs all the help in the world. And, oh yeah, definitely. And when you, th especially when you think about just children in general, you know, especially if children are going through hard times, like they really don't have a voice and they really don't have a platform, whether, you know, they're at school or if it's a broken home, you know, parents are struggling, anything like that. They really don't have anyone or any place to really sit there and express themselves freely. Yeah. So play is, plays their way of expressing. Yeah, their expression, but also their their way of learning too. You know, when you think about yourself, just growing up, you know, how much did you learn, you know, individually through playing, you know, like problem solving and how to regulate your own emotions and everything. Yeah, I think I based, I think everything I learned throughout my entire life that I use now was because of my play and I me mean, just experiencing and doing like what I liked. Yeah, exactly. And even just, you know, when we make mistakes through play, you know, we know the next time that we can't put a square in a circle. So, you know, it's yeah. that learning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I know with uh, with my kid, uh, my wife and I, we're, we're going to start him off with very basic toys. So just like a piece of wood, you know, like a square block. Yeah. Because he's never really seen anything like that before. So it's like brand new. There's one thing I actually want to talk to you about was like overstimulation with kids. But we can we can talk about that later. Yeah, definitely. A big thing that I, I really like about what you do and uh, what I think is super interesting and probably like different for a lot of uh, physicians out there is your integration of technology with play. Could you touch on that a little bit? Definitely with technology, I think it goes back to when I was doing my first year of working with clients and you know, started to recognize, one, our society is so heavily you know, tech-based, uh, I think especially you know, where we live too. So I started to realize that that was a way of connecting with uh, children. Don't quote me on the exact percentage, but I, I heard it so long ago, but I believe <laughs> it is 90% of successful therapy is related around the relationship. So even if they say, even if the person doesn't know what they're doing, as long as you can create a, a relationship with that person, there will be some sort of, you know, benefit. So we talk a lot about the therapeutic, you know, relationship being absolutely important. And it makes sense. You know, if you don't make a connection right away, then how is that person going to be able to open up? Yeah, absolutely. So I kind of just saw that a few of the people that I was working with, you know, they, they really liked technology. And so, you know, I thought to myself, okay, well, I grew up with a lot of different technology. I grew up with a lot of different games and I think the first time it really hit me was when I was practicing just kind of like a reflecting, they call it basically just like a non-directive technique in play therapy. So you're not labeling anything to kind of pull them out of the unconscious, but you're sitting there really saying, you know, you move that there, you put that there, you know, like you're, you're not labeling, like if you say, oh, you move that fire truck, like to them, that might not be a fire truck. Mm. And so you can pull them out of the unconscious and then you, they're not really opening up after that. So that's so interesting. Like exactly what you just said. If you just like pulling them out of the unconscious. And so if they interpret something to be something, then you want to keep that with them instead of telling them what it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And for me, you know, I, I remember growing up, especially being at your house and watching you and Adam play or, you know, watching your dad play. 
not really knowing what was going on on the screen because I was so young. And I would just be like, wow, you did that. How did you do that? You know, and so it really made me think back to those moments and it just came genuine for me. It was natural. So naturally, I was able to kind of bring that into my sessions with video games to have that same kind of genuine, authentic kind of reflection. It's so funny when you say, when you say back in the day when we were playing games and stuff, every time you say that, I remember it too. I remember you sitting next to us and like pointing it out. I just remember that. That was just so fun. That was so cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, it's such a, it's such an awesome memory. Okay, cool. Well, why don't you provide the uh, listeners with some information that they can go to, like uh, some links, just kind of briefly touch on some of the stuff that you want to provide to uh, our audience. And all those links will be in the description show notes down below. So please check those out. Yeah, I think definitely the biggest one is the Association for Play Therapy has a lot of great resources, has a connection to uh, even just YouTube videos. Some of the videos on there are perfect and very short to kind of show or understand play more in depth and how it's used therapeutically with children and the importance and why. And then also some of the other links that will be in the description will be some references to some people that have made a huge impact on my career professionally. Got to do those plugs. That's right. <laughs> so what are you, what are you doing for work now? So I have two different roles that I do for work. Uh, I still am a clinician. And then I also am working on trying to find both creative ways to use technology to kind of enhance growth and development but also how to utilize technology to streamline the process to make it easier for parents or really just anyone. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people can resonate currently right now with our, you know, healthcare system and having to kind of go to, you know, 10, 20 different offices as opposed to, you know, having everything kind of streamlined and then that becomes exhausting and then people just give up. And yeah, you take it on a big feet right there, that type of work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Michael has something that's uh, really exciting for, for him and I. So why don't you tell the audience about that one? Yeah, I've always been a strong believer in trying to give back, whether it's the people who came before us, especially for me, you know, professionally without, you know, their hard work and really kind of, you know, trailblazing. I wouldn't have this opportunity to really enjoy one, just being a therapist working with a uh, proper way of working with children, but two, also integrating, you know, my love of, you know, kind of technology and video games to connect and help children heal. We're excited that we'll be working on a podcast to be able to kind of look at the early history of play. So kind of like the pioneers, and then also, you know, looking back at some of the past and also present leaders, and then how it's kind of assisting the youth such as myself currently, and then the future as well. So we will be having a bunch of different guests from all over the world to kind of come on and talk about how they learn to play, how they use it across all different cultures. Very fascinating way to see benefit and growth. We're both super excited about it. And especially with, with Michael's passion that he has, it's really, it's really addicting and it makes me want to be more involved. And it's, it just sounds super fun. And that's something that we're planning on um, taking head on after the first of the year. So please stay tuned for that. We'll keep everybody updated with uh, the Generations podcast. Yeah, really excited. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be really neat just to hear these these people talk about what they love. And just it's it's really exciting for me just to, just to be part of it, just to be like a, a fly on the wall, basically. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's really cool. But, you know, it also, I think, kind of helps you in the moment as being a new father yourself and just kind of seeing how there are lots of benefits of play, but also how it can be used in many different ways. You know, um, that we sit there and tell people that you don't need to know a specific language, native language, wherever you're at, you can put a toy in front of any child and they'll know how to play with it. It may not be your version or your understanding of play, but they'll know how to play with anything. Yeah. And that's what I know how to do. I know how to play with stuff. 
<laughs> Look, looking forward to it. Yeah, you know, I was actually thinking a little about a little bit about what you said too. And then for my son, you know, I'm trying to I'm starting to pick up on cues. You know, he can't really like tell me what he needs and wants, but I know what he's opening his mouth up. And, you know, he seems like he's hungry. And then when he has a big old yawn, I know he's you know he's ready to go back to sleep. So it's kind of interesting. I can I can already kind of he's not really playing, but I can pick up on those cues that he's making and where he's trying to communicate. So I can kind of understand what he needs. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. You know, especially as he gets older and, you know, maybe you see, cause you'll know intuitively, plus you'll see he may be frustrated or, you know, having like a hard day, especially, you know, coming home from school and you may naturally want to be like, Hey, you know, why are you angry? And he's going to be like, I'm not angry, but you know, he may like go and like, you know, just slam something, you know, that that's like <laughs> it right there in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's cool. Yeah. So yeah, we're looking forward to that podcast. Stay tuned for that. So let's get a little bit more zesty with uh, the play therapy. So Michael, what kind of other involvements and events or community-based things have you done with play therapy? That's cool to share with us. Uh, As I mentioned a little bit as to like my motivation for kind of looking at our podcast coming soon, I just love going to conference and like different conferences, whether they're, you know, out of state or, you know, internationally, uh, domestically, just to learn. It's always, you know, kind of fascinating to kind of see the different types of play. And it's all for the same reason to help children. Yeah. So, you know, I like when I was still in grad school, I got some really good advice to just say yes to everything. <laughs> so some of the opportunities that I've been able to have um, being involved with just some of the really local things, um, such as, you know, the county I live in and being a part of that chapter of the California Association for Play Therapy. I've had the opportunity to present at a couple different universities on integrating technology into play and then been able to kind of just do presentations for diff- various different, you know, private practices as well. But then also, you know, being able to kind of do some things internationally. Thank God we have FaceTime and Skype now. <laughs> kind of go back to the podcast, too. So Michael is going to he's going to try to record a lot of these events also. So is that something that you're interested in and through that podcast? You'll hear those live events that are recorded. And though, so that's kind of a work in progress, too. But that's something that we really want to incorporate into that podcast. That's that's fun for anybody, you know, not everybody can go to those events, but a lot of people want to learn about it. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's always cool to kind of see as I, as I keep mentioning, you know, just the difference of minds understanding. I mean, there's so many different theories and perspectives and approaches to, you know, how you want to work, you know, as a, as a play therapist. And the cool thing about the community is that, you know, for the most part, there's, been some tips before in the past, but, um, for the most part, as as from everything I've ever seen being in the community so far is everyone's very respectful. People won't trash a a certain way that you're coming about it. If it's not in line with their goals, they, they, you know, they have an open mind to how other people use it. Yeah. And I think you have to have an open mind because life is changing. Technology changes and trends change and what people like change. And it's cool that people will at least listen to what you have to say. So how do, how do people kind of react when you tell them I incorporate games into what I do? Yeah, I think there was definitely kind of a, had to kind of go about it in a very kind of slow way. Um, There's a lot of research on, play and past and presently on the use of board games, um, you know, kind of therapeutically. So when I first decided to start using different types of, you know, technology and video games, it was how can I take very well-known play interventions and find the same meaning of the intervention on a technological platform? So you know, the idea that we're playing on a board game with, you know, maybe multiple, multiple kids at the same time to kind of work on social skills. It's the same thing as playing like Mario party. You know, it's basically a a virtual board game, you know, where you have like 
three versus one, two versus two, one versus uh, three. I always said that. Or um, the whole team. <laughs> Everyone's <laughs> no, no, let's keep working a track. together. Keep, keep, yeah, keep going. <laughs> yeah, so it's basically, you know, being able to say, like, the platform is different, yes, but the intervention is the same. And the reason why the platform is different is because it's relatable information for the child and it's their world. If I try to force a specific kind of intervention on someone, then that may, you know, try and mess with the treatment in some way. It'll it'll destroy, I don't want to say destroy, but it'll, you know, kind of maybe break or rupture the relationship in that moment. So it's important for me to be able to have as many different things as I can in the room, whether that's technology or I do have physical board games as well. It's all about what they connect to. Besides, you know, the, the fact that you do video games and how it's, uh, it's kind of almost controversial almost mm -hmm. like, is that the growing trend now or a lot more physicians coming up, getting on board with video games? Maybe, do you notice that? Yeah, I think that people are starting to recognize that there is a place for technology and video games in play. I think that play has gotten, or sorry, rather, technology fairly and unfairly has gotten a lot of kind of negative press. So naturally, people kind of assume that just having some sort of technology in the room may be taking away from the treatment. So, for example... So so what do you mean by taking away? Oh, you're about to do an example. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. So I was just going to say, for example, a lot of people kind of think that if you have an iPad that's in the room the child may just kind of go in the corner and sit there and just be by themselves. Right. And it's not the iPad that's doing that. I mean, the biggest thing is that whatever is in the playroom is chosen by the therapist. We really want to make sure that whatever we're bringing in to the playroom, we, you know, kind of understand it, research it, see how it would be used because then that way, you know, if the child does, want to play with it, you know that they're not just going to go over there and sit and be by themselves kind of thing. So you get to kind of control what's in the room. It's really on the therapist, really. And if you don't feel comfortable or you don't really know, hey, I don't know like what I would really be doing with this, then you don't have to put it in there. You know what I mean? So what? So explain the uh, the playroom real quick. What, what exactly in there? What kind of setups do you have? Is it an isolated room? There's a bunch of people. How, how's it look? Give us a picture. Yeah. So the playroom is basically a playroom. No, um, <laughs> it has uh, just various different, you know, kind of activities or things in the room that the child can use and the therapist would use as intervention. So very common things are puppets. We do a lot of like role playing. We have a lot of sand tray and miniatures and figurines as an expressive activity. We also have various different types of art. So we have lots of, you know, paper, markers, crayons, paint. For me, I also have an iPad, two different VR headsets, a Nintendo Switch. And Uno. Yeah, I mean, we have lots of card games. I can't begin to tell you how many times I've played Uno. <laughs> When they, when kids or younger kids, or older kids, when they first walk into this room, this sounds like a, a magic, magic land to me. I mean, I love to hang out in there. What do they gravitate towards? Do you notice what they gravitate towards the most? Yeah, I think a lot of them really love the technology piece. They're just I, drawn to it. Yeah. And, and, you know, I could even say that, you know, most of, really anyone, not even related to, you know, specifically just children, as I see, you know, different types of ages and individuals and couples and families and stuff, but they're all drawn to the technology. And I think a lot of that has to do with, I mean, even just yourself, you know, you're, you're a new parent and, you know, you grew up with technology. So it's, you have a great understanding of technology. And if, you know, you were coming in for family therapy, 
if I was someone who really didn't understand technology or really wasn't comfortable with it and you were trying to explain something and using a lot of different words and I was just kind of sitting there saying, well, hold on, can you explain that to me? Like naturally you're going to be like, okay, maybe this person doesn't fully understand my world. That's a good way to like just communicate, just be able to like pick something up and you have that instant connection with somebody also, especially if you, you know, you are a fan of games and if a kid's a fan of games and, oh, look at this Nintendo Switch. You're like, oh, yeah, I got some cool games on there. Yeah, and the message that they're feeling is, wow, this person really understands my world, you know, so therefore it's going to instantly b build a sense of comfort for them to be able to express themselves freely. Yeah, and then when you start, when you start schooling them on Mario Kart, then he's like, then the kid's like, okay, this guy knows what's up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's that's, that's always been very interesting, and it has been a topic of discussion for a long time. You know, people, like with just board games, it's, you know, do you let kids win? You know, how do you deal with them cheating? So there's a lot of different views on what people believe. Oh, no way. So I really want to get involved in that, but I'll, that's like a different podcast. So <laughs> I, that'll, that'll come soon, so I'm actually really interested in that. So... Now, as you're kind of going through school, college, and currently, you know, how do some of your colleagues, other like therapists view play therapy? Is it pretty, is it is accepted? And then actually also, how do they view it with, with how you integrate video games into it? Yeah, definitely with the industry, you'll find a lot of people who say that they do play therapy, but their version of play therapy is... I'm going to put a toy or a game in front of a child to get them to talk. So they're playing to get them to talk. So they'll, they'll maybe put down something and then kind of ask them a direct question. And that goes against the very essence of what play therapy is. So it gets kind of distorted and people have different perceptions of it. So I think that it's really an important kind of topic. Uh, and that's why I love going to different universities to just talk about play therapy, because I, you know, find that sometimes they don't really have too much knowledge on it. And so it's really cool to be able to kind of steer them into like, Hey, if you're interested more, you know, check this out because in my biased view, you know, that's the only way to work with a child. Right. Yeah. So I don't, I don't, I don't know if you want to mention the college or not, but you recently went to a university and talked about your passion play therapy and you kind of not debunked, but kind of proved the professor wrong in a way. You want to share that story or? Maybe I'll hold off on that. You want to hold off on that one? Okay. That'll, <laughs> Just because I don't want to ruin that, that career or <laughs> that connection. <laughs> All right, maybe, maybe later. So <laughs> I can share so, some of my own personal experience of like when yeah. I went through college and there wasn't too much of an emphasis on it. So, yeah. So actually that's now when you did presentations in school, uh, how did other students kind of react to it? I definitely know that, you know, I had gone through my practicum site and had a pretty good depth of understanding of play therapy and had gone to various play therapy conferences and when I got to kind of like the child therapy class for my program, you know, it was one of those like one unit in the summer kind of thing. And I remember, you know, kind of really excited, like, oh, this is going to be so cool. Like, you know, I'm going to learn some new things. And I remember going to the professor after the class and I was like, hey, uh, the, the first class. And I was like, hey, are we going to talk about all sorts of different techniques. We're going to talk about directive, you know, we gonna, are we going to talk about, you know, integrating, we're going to talk about being prescriptive and just kind of looked at me like, I'm barely going to talk about like what a playroom is and how to set it up. And I was like, Oh, dang, <laughs> like I'm super bummed. <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. Yeah. The same thing happened with me in school too. I, I kind of started school late and I kind of knew a lot of the stuff going into it. So I totally relate to what you just said. It just, you get, you, you're excited for something and all of a sudden you're like, Oh, Okay, I figured that out on the internet by myself. Yeah, no, it's uh, it, it was definitely one of those kind of like eye openers for me where I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, I think that that is one of the motivating reasons behind the the podcast that we're coming up with is because, you know, I think that it really is important to be able to understand what play therapy is and how to work with children properly. 
Were you able to add to what the professor was teaching or you just kind of just sat through the class and just got that one unit out of the way? That was actually the really cool thing is that, you know, she was very open to kind of like asking, you know, what I have learned. And then she provided a lot of really great insight as well to. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. With just her, you know, decades of kind of working with uh, some of the you know children in various different settings and everything. So it was, it was a great class. I really loved it. So let's go a little bit more to how you, when you present. So how, how do you feel? Will you get like a rush out of that? Like, how do you prepare? You know, it's almost as if you're having to kind of like defend your position, so to speak, at least for me personally, you know, it's kind of like, I feel like I'm walking into a room of people that are just totally against what I have to say. And how am I going to convince them? And so, you know, I always want to convince them with information they'll understand. So that's where I, you know, I go back to showing how interventions can be done across multiple different platforms as, you know, as long as it's with the same intent. And then I also want to show them the research behind it. And then I also want to be able to have them see how it can be beneficial. So, you know, whether that's through any type of case study or understanding And then I want to keep the language very simple too. So if I come in and just start talking about, you know, all kinds of different various consoles and everything like that, they'll, they'll just check out and then I've lost them. Like as soon as you start talking, as soon as you start nerding hard on them, they're like, oh, okay, I'm bored now. Yeah, exactly. So, and I think the biggest thing that I've noticed too is I think with anyone, with any presentation, when you have more visuals, of course, they're going to love that. So Video games have a lot of really amazing visuals, so that's a way to really kind of help them understand that technology can provide a very immersive experience and in a way that sometimes we can't provide within our playroom. You know, it's like if I'm trying to have a teenager who's in virtual reality, you know, I can't create that same immersive scene within the playroom. And I bet that when uh, you're giving these presentations also, all the students are, they're all about it because they grew up with technology. So they're just, they, they're, they seem already on board with it. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'll always remember that one of the first opportunities that I had to kind of present, um, my supervisor, you know, had seen that I was using virtual sand tray as well as the traditional sand tray. So the actual physical, you know, box with sand in it. And she was teaching a sand tray class at a play therapy for a play therapy certification program uh, at Loma Linda University. And she said, Hey, you know, would you like to come in and talk? And I said, Oh yeah, absolutely. I would love to. So, you know, went in there and was kind of showing how there's different ways and there's different pros and cons to using traditional sand tray and then also virtual sand tray. The idea that you may have kids who don't want to touch the sand, especially if you have kids that are, you know, on the spectrum. So that's where it can be a benefit. The virtual sand tray on an iPad is also a benefit if you're working within a hospital setting with different children, because, you know, you can't really have like the, the sand, you know, spilling everywhere. You can't really have all the germs passing through it. So after the presentation, great presentation, and I want to say maybe a year later, um, when I was doing a lot of stuff for the San Bernardino County play therapy chapter, I had someone walk up and, you know, I was sitting there and they, they said, Hey, do you, do you remember me? And I said, you look really familiar. And they said, yeah, yeah, you came to, you know, my, my sand tray class and presented on virtual sand tray. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, I remember that now. And then she said, you know, after that presentation, I immediately went to my supervisor and said, there's another way to do therapy, you know, and that's with technology. <laughs> that is that is so awesome. She said that to you. Yeah, it totally, totally threw me off guard. You know, it was yeah. one of those like great things where I was like, hey, as long as I could always just spread whatever I've learned and if people resonate with it, cool. If they don't, hey, that's all right, too. Yeah, exactly. That's so cool. How did you feel after that? Just we'll oh, keep going with your story. Act. Sorry, the topic for the presentation, rather, I was just sitting there in the crowd, um, working as a part of the the chapter, putting on the presentation, hosting it, and it was at a university. The university wasn't actively involved, other than just letting us use their facilities. So, a lot of the people in the crowd 
We're asking all sorts of questions. Most of them are college students themselves from the actual college that we were there. And I was able to kind of share through kind of asking a question, but also answer it about, oh yeah, I use it this way. Or, you know, I, I've integrated this and just people get really excited and they want to know more, especially if they are gamers themselves. So, because it's relatable language for them, you know, it's like, and I start talking about how I can use super smash brothers to help children understand, you know, how anger manifests and how, you know, if it's repressed, it, it takes one small tap, just like in Super Smash Brothers, you know, you hit 300%, one small tap, knocked off the screen instantly. When you start explaining things like that, especially to people who play games, like, they, they're like, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> you know, they get really happy and excited. Yeah, I remember, I think the episode two that we did, you talked about what the, talked about that with Matt, and he still kind of mentions that to me every once in a while, that small tap when you're at 300%. So that, that, that connected with him really well. He understands that. Yeah, you know, it's language that you understand. It's also, you know, as you've played it so much, like it's created this kind of visual for you to really know what that looks like because we've all been in that experience, you know, on yeah. Super Smash. And we've all been at that point where we've repressed so much stuff that like the smallest tap just kind of makes us super upset or, you know, more upset than what we should be in that current moment. So, so what are some other really important people in your life? that made an impact on you regarding play therapy and get to tell us if there's a certain way they could be reached. Yeah. I think the, the biggest one, I mean, definitely on a minor level of my supervisor, she's not really too active. We would be able to find her, but uh, she was so open to everything. And just the idea that, you know, she said, Hey, you know what? I see that what you're doing is very beneficial and, as you explain it, it makes sense, but maybe sometimes I don't fully understand it, but you know what? It seems like it, it is making a difference for these children. So had I not had that experience, I don't think where I, where I am right now, I would be. So that was really huge for me that she was very open-minded and very like paying attention to the detail to make sure that what I was doing was proper. And then from there, I was able to meet my mentor his name is Dr. Jessica Stone, and she's a psychologist and has been doing play therapy for around 20 years now. And I met her at a local California play therapy association conference, and she was presenting on the virtual sand tray. And I was sitting there and I was just talking about like, wow, this is so cool. Like, I see you can use, use it this way and this way. And I was really excited. And I was just sharing that with some of the people in the room and her and I always laugh over the story because as I was getting ready to leave, she was speaking with someone and she's like, Hey, you don't leave until I talk to you. And I was like, Oh geez, I didn't break anything. I swear. <laughs> Cause she had, you know, like 10 iPads or so in there <laughs> and that created our kind of connection. And she has been a huge mentor for, for me both individually, but also helping me, you know, kind of, get my feet underneath, allow me to have certain platforms through writing, you know, articles and things like that for her to kind of really get my name out there. So I'm very thankful for her. And you can definitely check out the virtual sand tray link and the reference link. The other person is one of my dear friends who is also an extension of my mentor, but um, her name is Dr. Heidi Kadison. And she's fantastic. She has more energy than I do. <laughs> and that's kind of hard. Um, yeah, that's kind of hard, man. That's, that's a bold statement. Yeah. So she she's inspirational, very insightful, but inspirational in that when you're around her and you just see her love and affection for play and working with children, I mean, you can't help but want to do the same as well. And she has done a lot of various publications and then she was mentored by ultimately one of my favorite people. And that's Dr. Charles Schaefer, the one that has been a huge part of the play therapy upbringing and outreach. So a lot of other various names that I could mention, but you know, those are some of the three that are very important to me. Then all, uh, all their information will be in the show notes. So if you're interested in checking out Heidi or, or whatnot, definitely see those links. 
there's a lot of influential, passionate people in your life. So for you personally, what drives your passion? Because every time you talk about this subject, you can like, you can feel that you're happier. I can feel that you're happier. I can like sense it. It's like, so it makes me excited about it. It makes me want to learn more about it. But what's your, what's your passion about being a therapist? I appreciate it. Um, I think my passion for being a therapist is that I just want to be able to help a population such as children or, I mean, even really just kind of parents, but in a broad perspective, just anyone, if I can be someone that can help provide an environment and some sort of, you know, assistance alongside you to really help you come to the realization as to, you know, specific things that you have gone through in your life or, you know, looking at goals in the future or being able to find specific kind of coping skills to be able to utilize, you know, in the moment when you're feeling bad, like that's, there's no greater feeling for me personally to see that. And oftentimes people just need that environment, especially families, because, uh, you know, sometimes for families, it's really hard to sit and have a very hard conversation at home. So sometimes just the environment that you're in when you're, you know, in the room with me, it's creating a different environment. And oftentimes I'll generally always tell families, it's like, Hey, you know, in here, I want you guys to express yourself freely. And when you leave, don't beat each other up verbally about what someone said, you know, what you say in here stays in here. And I find that resonates a lot with them. Makes it feel like they, like they can trust you. That's super important. Yeah, definitely. Now, if you're your ultimate goal, the one thing that you want to accomplish, the one thing that you want to be remembered for forever. So what is your dream at the end of all this? I think just to inspire people uh, to find their passion and their creative medium and integrate that into a way that can help, you know, connect with the child. Yeah, I think recently, you know, I had spoken to someone who is very interested in the play. And then they were also talking about like various different arts and music and kind of said like, hey, you know, I'm not really sure if, you know, the the supervisor that I have, if they'll be kind of open to this. And, you know, I said, hey, you know, if this is something you're really interested in, you're really passionate about, look more into play, then look at exactly what you love about what you're talking about and see if there is a connection and if there's a population that you feel could benefit from this. And that's the way that I did it. You know, I, I looked at it and of course there's a lot of games that you can play just for fun. But then there's a lot of games that like I can look at and go like, wow, you know what? I learned so much about myself. And so if I can just inspire other people to do the same and my ultimate goal and dream would actually be and a lot of people kind of laugh, but like, I would love to not have a job because to me, <laughs> what that would mean is that no one is struggling. Right. Uh, I get what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's 100 percent true. And you know, with with you know, I think with children, especially if we can help give them the tools to help build a solid foundation at a young age, it'll make their path through life a lot easier. As opposed to when we're older and we've been through something for so long, it's really hard to kind of go back and help work through specific things that have been going on for, you know, decades. It's like the behavior is instinctual. So we can really only help manage with like different, you know, coping. Yeah. Super cool. You want to add anything else or you want to mention anything else to the, uh, the viewers or listeners? No, I think that's it. All right, Michael. Well, I really appreciate you, you sitting down and telling everybody a little bit about yourself, a little bit about what you do. Michael and I have a play therapy podcast that's going to be in development, probably starting the first of 2020. And we're both uh, really looking forward to that and really excited about that. And thank you so much for spending a bunch of time with me and tell me about you. Yeah, thank you for allowing me to have this opportunity to really sit and talk about it in a you know deeper connecting experience. I really appreciate it. I always get excited. Yeah, you definitely make it super interesting and, and super addicting. I can't wait to hear more about it. I'm really looking forward to our, our uh, new podcast that's coming out. Yeah, same. Cool. Well, good night, everybody. Bye.
Thanks for listening. If you like great insight into games and terrible jokes, make sure to subscribe and come back for more. Thank you guys very much for listening to us ramble on. Please check out our Twitter, which is at SneakPixel. We also have a YouTube channel. It's under SneakPixel, and then my name, Jason Eric. And thank you very much. We're looking forward to the next one. Make sure you subscribe. And we're the Generations Life of Video Games podcasters. Thank you.